This might sound all kind of scary. Oh, there's, there's no going back and we're under attack. We are, but the change is before we didn't realize it. We didn't know. We didn't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Now we've got all the evidence. And so actually now we're in a better position of power to act. Now our eyes are open. Now we see the threat. Now we can do something about it. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of On the Edge. Now, during the recording of this week's episode, um, what I think was always going to kind of be an inevitability finally happened, and that is uh, some uh, interruptions due to what Moscow's up to here. Um, our guest schedule was so tight that we really couldn't do it another day. But even if we could, I think in some ways it's very important that you see how it is we're living here. Uh, we're speaking this week with Jessica Berlin, who is a highly regarded expert on uh, global uh, geopolitics and security. She's got a very long CV and has lots of areas of expertise. But of course, we uh, focus in on European reaction to the war here in Ukraine. I hope you will find it uh, informative, but also uh, a look into how things are here in Ukraine. Please enjoy. Jessica, thank you for joining us uh, on The Edge uh, this week. Thanks for having um, me. Let's get straight to it. Um, with your expertise on both sides of the Atlantic, how do you think uh, the difference is how the Americans have approached this war and how Europeans have, if you think there is a difference. That's a really good question. And it's not as simple as it seems. Of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine hits much closer to home in Europe. And yet at the same time, you would be shocked, or maybe you personally wouldn't be, but it is sometimes shocking to see how people, even in the heart of Europe, less than a full day's drive from the Ukrainian border, um, act like this conflict is happening um, somewhere on the other side of the world. And so in the American case, you know, you can understand somebody living in Kansas um, saying, what does this war have to do with me? It's very far away. But it's much less understandable when you hear that kind of sentiment coming from somebody living in, say, Berlin. Um, when the war is uh, just a 12-hour drive away. So uh, we have on both sides of the Atlantic um, perhaps a, a sense of disconnect and unreality uh, that this, how can this be happening at this day and age? Yeah. Uh, we thought wars like this on our turf uh, in, in the free world were behind us. And even two and a half years in, um, that, that still uh, unfortunately um, is is shaping some of the delayed response. Um, in Germany in particular, um, I will say, of course, there's a huge uh, difference um, than what the American public experiences, and that is with Ukrainian refugees ah. who are, who are uh, living with us now. Um, right. You know, there are millions across Europe, um, most in Poland, followed by Germany. You know, it makes sense. The for, you know, it's close to Ukraine. Um, you will have more people who stayed um, and over a million refugees from Ukraine are currently living in Germany, um, and German communities have really um, embraced and welcomed people in. And what you maybe don't see so much in media is the quiet humanitarian generosity uh, and dignity of German communities uh, welcoming and helping Ukrainian refugees in the day-to-day. Um, what you see much more of, of course, is the uh, the more uh, vitriolic uh, anti-immigration sentiments, which, however, are not targeted just at Ukrainians. But right. um, but this is a, a long going issue in Germany um, since since the refugee crisis under Merkel. So, you know, I would say, in my opinion, actually, both as a as a German and an American, 
the sense of unreality that that I get from from folks who who are far away from politics yeah, it's, is similar. It's, it's almost like the containment policy of trying to keep this limited to Ukraine is a double edged sword because it it mm. it does you know allow people to go about their lives in Europe completely ignoring what's happening right next door. Mm -hmm. um, do you see any erosion in that? Do you see the the patience of say the German people? Uh, uh, you know, any any fraying at the edges? Well, what you've just touched upon is actually, I think, one of the biggest misunderstandings of this war. The bombs are falling on Ukrainian territory, but the war is already well beyond Ukraine's borders. Ah, yes, agreed. Russia is waging hybrid war against all of democratic Europe, against the United States, against all of NATO. Ukraine is a part of a global war against democracy, an attempt to recreate the world order in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And the fact that our politicians and media across the democratic free world have failed to raise the alarm on this threat, have failed to stop and deter these actions, whether it's uh, hacking of our infrastructure, uh, and companies and government agencies, uh, whether it's election interference, it's espionage, buying politicians, buying media. I mean, a, not a week goes by in Germany without a new report of a, a spy being uncovered in Agency X or a, a media influencer being revealed um, as bought by or backed by Russia, whether mm -hmm. known or unknown by the person in question, this is going on nonstop. And the cases that we're finding that are coming to light, whether in the US uh, or, or Germany or elsewhere, it's just the tip of the iceberg. And I, and I also see, and I wonder if you see the same thing and would like to comment on it, is, is the, the Russian influence into our body politic, our media mm -hmm. sphere, um, uh, particularly when it comes to the far right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, you know, we have parties all throughout Europe that have very, very suspicious connections to the Kremlin mm -hmm. and are getting sources. We have, of course, the MAGA movement in America, mm -hmm. uh, in Germany, you have AFD mm -hmm. in France, we have Le Pen in Britain. There's, you know, uh, the, the, um, what is it? Uh, the, the, the. The British, uh, yeah, Farage, you know, UK, Farage, and, the National yeah. Front, those kind of guys. Yeah. So I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the threat you see of Russian influence in this, these sectors right. in, in Europe. Well, first and foremost, it's not new news. <laughs> we know, I mean, it, this is old news that Russian money supported the Brexit referendum, mm -hmm. uh, the Leave campaign, that Russian hackers, Russian disinformation, and Russian money supported attacks against Hillary Clinton, the hack of her emails, mm -hmm. um, all the bot campaigns on American social media pushing pro-Trump stuff, and that's going on to this day. I mean, it's been eight years. And I, I, I it, it just baffles me. Yeah. Baffles me that this isn't more prescient in our, yeah. in our society. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. We're under attack. Yes. Full stop. Yeah. And uh, it's it's been particularly interesting to watch in, in Germany. Uh, it's as though you're, you're living in some kind of bizarro world where on the one hand, you'll have a government intelligence agency come out and say, uh, yes, uh, the Russians are waging hybrid warfare against us in the information space. Also, there have been literal uh, attempts at sabotage and bombings. Yes. Um, of assassinations. German, yeah, yeah. Well, Potential assassinations. Yeah, well, there, there were uh, attacks on German military mm -hmm. installations um, and a foiled attempted attack. Um, uh, also, there the fires in the, in the UK at this warehouse that was uh, housing military equipment that was meant to go uh, to Ukraine. This, they're moving even from the information space to kinetic sabotage yes. because they've seen that our governments are doing nothing. And in the case of Germany, you'll see on the one hand reports um, of sabotage attempts or of uh, you know, information and influence campaigns coming from Russia. And then 
in the same day of news, you'll also see that the Schultz administration is not going to deliver Towers missiles, is not going to allow or support Ukraine to uh, use Western donated weapons to hit targets on Russian territory. And you have to ask yourselves, what's our strategy here, guys? What's yeah. the goal? Are we under attack? Do we want to win this fight? And if so, what is the strategy and what are the tactics we're going to use to win? How are we going to stop them? And I don't think that's actually been, the message has not been received in the heads of a lot of our politicians who are still somehow clinging to the idea that there's, there's a return to business as usual somewhere in the middle horizon. Right. And that is a fallacy. Guys, there's no going back. Yeah. To the one sort way of or the other, Europe end is of history, not going to be post Cold War little bubble. No, however it's this over. shakes out, however this no. shakes out, one way or the yeah. other, we never yeah. go back to Europe before the full scale invasion of of Ukraine. Well, and I don't know why that doesn't. It's it's not even in, in this traction. case. It's really it's about Russia. We got the, we got it wrong. Yeah, we got Russia wrong. Yeah, we did. And now we are paying the price for it. And above all, Ukraine is paying the price well, for it. Yeah, and. And until that fundamental reality sinks into some heads in some important places, we will remain in this sort of bizarro stasis where we see reports of Russia and China as well attacking our democracies, buying influence, um, sabotaging our industries uh, and even our militaries, mm -hmm. uh, attacking our allies, killing thousands with impunity. And then on the other hand, we're not even implying the sanctions that are in place uh, to their full force. Yeah. Um, we're still letting Russian, uh, the, the families uh, of Russian oligarchs go to college and uh, beach holidays across the, across the free world. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to act like things can still go on as they were, even as the evidence rains down on us that the world has changed forever. Yeah. And um, I would say, I mean, to your viewers, this might sound all kind of scary. Oh, there's no going back and we're under attack. We are, but guys, it hasn't actually changed. The, the changes, before we didn't realize it. We didn't know. We didn't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Now we've got all the evidence. And so actually now we're in a better position of power to act. Now our eyes are open. Now we see the threat. Now we can do something about it. I get your point. It's it's at least now we recognize. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the possibility of a direct conference? Because there's a lot of talk, especially mm -hmm. in D.C., mm -hmm. uh, from say Jake Sullivan or some other folks. Mm -hmm. uh, we see it on this side of, of of the pond as well of this fear of a, a escalation that will result in a direct confrontation, a confrontation between the West and Russia. Um, what is your mm -hmm. thinking about that possibility? And, you know. Okay. So I think the so-called escalation managers have understood the threat backwards. Okay. What does that mean? These guys are worried that we're going to do something that will make Russia want to attack a NATO member. That's backwards. Russia wants to attack NATO members. Russia wants to attack the Baltic states. Russia wants to attack Poland. But they want to get away with it. Exactly. That's the problem So for them. Exactly. they know they'll lose a direct conflict. They know they would lose a direct conflict. So what are they doing? They they. They don't believe that the countries uh, that lived for decades under Soviet occupation and for centuries under Russian imperial occupation, they don't think these countries have a right to exist. And that's a mentality that I think is hard for a lot of Westerners to, to internalize. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the analogy I would give is imagine if... Um, it was normal for uh, people in the British government to think that uh, Ghana and Jamaica and India don't really exist as free nation states and free people. Ireland. 
or Ireland for that matter, exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I make the analogy with Ireland yeah, all the time. Yeah, exactly. Um, and of course, everybody today would say, well, that's bonkers. The yeah. empire's dead. Yeah. And that was a good and thing. And the concept of imperialism yeah. is something that is maybe not completely put in our past, mm -hmm. but something in the West right. that we we are we are very uncomfortable with the concept of yes. empire. Because we Mos also were guilty. We, we had exactly. empires and they were yeah. disastrous, not yeah. only for the people we colonized, but for ourselves ultimately as well. Ultimately. The Moscovites, the Russians, mm -hmm. have not learned this lesson No, yet. exactly. Yeah. And so in their... In their worldview and uh, in their so-called uh, sphere of influence, which they think they is, is something they have a right to, yes. um, um, you know, Lithuania Just, should do what we want because – Yeah, because yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're afraid yeah. because we, are, we mm. fear for our security, the Russians say, that we mm. deserve yes. this buffer zone. Well, yeah, that denies yeah. millions and millions yeah. of people autonomy just it's, because Moscow's scared. Yeah, it's, it's nonsense. It's and, bizarre. Yeah, and we know it's not true anyway. I mean, it's, it's just posing to, to get back to your question, um, to frighten folks in the West. Mm-hmm into this fear of escalation, this, again, that reversal of, of the causality. No, Russia wouldn't attack Lithuania or Poland or Finland because something Washington does. This is something they would actually like to do anyway, mm -hmm. but what they're looking for is an opening. They've, already, they've been testing it bit by bit, attacking Georgia. Yeah. Test one. Yeah. Oh, we got away with that. All right, we can keep going. To 2014, Donbass, Crimea. Oh, we got away with it. Mm. Oh, we even shot down an airplane uh, full of uh, Malaysians and Dutch and, yeah. uh, and, and other internationals. MH, we got away yeah, with it. MH17, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. We got away with it. All right, so for the last 10, 15 years, they have slowly but surely been pushing the bar of what they're allowed to do and get away with. Um, and each time presenting it as though, oh, this is a fait accompli, uh, plausible deniability, uh, the little green men. Once it's done. Once it's done, it's done. Right. Exactly. They've, 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 they have successfully reshaped the chessboard. Yeah. And, and reset the chessboard in their favor. And now with the full scale invasion of Ukraine, that is where, uh, they arguably bit off more than they could chew. Mm -hmm. um, I think they underestimated the both the resilience of Ukraine and Ukrainians, both from the military right on down to babushkas uh, throwing jars of pickles at drones. Yeah. They, they underestimated Ukraine, and they also underestimated uh, how quickly Ukraine's allies would scramble. Mm -hmm. And it was too slow, too little, too late. But it was enough to help this country survive in those incredibly dark first days, weeks, and months. Um, however, the fact that after that initial scramble, we didn't go all in and help Ukraine uh, to actually win this war, mm -hmm. that was our huge tactical mistake that then once again gave Russia time to regroup, uh, to entrench the front lines. And also to completely reinvigorate their assaults on the hybrid warfare front on our countries and in our politics, uh, to try to uh, give local mouthpieces for Russian propaganda, whether that's uh, MAGA influencers or Sarah Wagenknechts in Germany. Um, you have people who are literally spouting Kremlin talking points verbatim, but they're doing it in our voices, in our languages, in our mm -hmm. local media. Either paid for or influenced by. Exactly. Um, you know, sources from. And it's been very effective. Russia. It has been very effective and dangerously so. I mean, mm -hmm. you even hear it now from elected officials in the United States. Absolutely. And I'm mm -hmm. sure you're hearing it in Germany, you know, from, mm -hmm. you know, folks who are reputable. Oh, even from um, the highest levels of Germany's ruling party, the SPD. Schultz's party, the Social Democrats, uh, they're the, the German equivalent of the Labour Party. And, uh, I mean, they've been uh, very close to, to Russia 
mm-hmm. literally since their their creation in the 1920s. Uh, you know, back in um, other times, so I'll spare you the the nerdy <laughs> historical details of socialism and all of this. But um, basically, you have right now as the the leading party of the German ruling coalition has been close to Russia in their entire party DNA from their earliest foundings um, through to the Ostpolitik of Willy Brandt during the Cold War um, to Gerhard Schröder's uh, notorious now uh, ties to <laughs> Russian gas and oil right. um, up to Olaf Scholz, personally, um, the chancellor who himself in, in the earliest days of his political career as a young man um, in uh, the, the wing of the SPD called the Jusos, the Young Socialists in Germany, mm-hmm. um, he was an ardent ally and proponent of uh, the East German dictatorship Actually, he did not think reunification was necessary or desirable. Did we just lose? Yeah. Um, Blin. Do you have a we do. generator? It's going to take a minute. Well, uh, away from our technical problems, we've got light at least for a little while longer from our power stations. So, Jessica, we'll move this along. We were talking prior to the power outage about the far right, and I think we pretty much covered covered you know how how, how the far right is is being fostered by by Russia, how it's it's perhaps not being fully addressed, but it, it may have woken some folks up yeah, uh, need, to the threat from Moscow. We need to recognize that this is not a coincidence. This is not. Uh, some groundswell of uh, right-wing extremism uh, that that was there all the time. These voices are being coordinated and amplified strategically and intentionally by our adversaries to undermine our democracies. Yeah. It's warfare, but with a body count, but informationally, and not only that, but it's molding public opinion. And it's working because it's bringing allies of Russia into power, which is their goal. And it's undermining decent, regular, everyday citizens' faith in democracy, in their countries, and in their society. It's making people think that these sort of right-wing and pro-Russian sentiments are normal and acceptable, and they're not. And this is where, both from a political level, but as well as on a civic level, we need more people calling bullshit. Yeah. Calling it out, mm-hmm. putting a spotlight on it, mm-hmm. uh, and, and making people aware that this isn't just some sort of innocuous, like, oh, they're they're lobbyists on Capitol Hill, exactly. or they're or they're giving money to Le Pen because they are common travelers with her. Mm-hmm. No, no, this is intentionally meant to destabilize, That's divide right. us, and divide and conquer, which That's is what right. Moscow always has done. I'd like to move on to another topic, though. Um, where, what kind of Russia? Uh, would Germany in particular, because of this relationship that you prior kind of described, this relationship, uh, this friendly, this intent for there to be good ties between Germany and Russia, what do you think Europeans and specifically Germans would like to see the conclusion? What, What kind of landscape would they like Europe to be at the conclusion of this war, do you think? Well, for the... It's a big, big, That's a big, big umbrella question, yeah. I recognize, but still. For the aching to return to business as usual with Russia set, it's energy. It's yeah. about the money. Yeah, turn more, They want to turn that yeah. sweet, sweet Russian gas back on. Yeah. Uh, the German economy uh, growth model for the last 20 years was based on cheap Russian gas to fuel our industry and uh, Chinese market to buy our stuff, yeah. Russia and China. So the fact that our relations with these countries are going down the toilet in other respects is very damaging to Germany's established economic interests mm-hmm. and also uh, politically damaging uh, for the two leading parties, the conservative CDU and um, the, the labor uh, SPD, who uh, created this state of affairs. What do you tell the German voting public 
that the crisis we find ourselves in and the fact that we made ourselves economically dependent on the two countries trying to actively undermine our democracy, that, yeah. that we did that. It was an own goal. Uh, it's uh, It actually um, has set up precisely some of the political paralysis you're seeing in Germany right now. Um, and this is where um, I wish I could say I was optimistic um, or I wish I could tell you that there's some uh, impressive politician um, or, or party uh, who's who's doing the right thing and 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 getting the message out there. But right now, what you're seeing is a lot of paralysis, a lot of the blind uh, leading the lame. And in each of the parties, interestingly, there are individuals who get it, who are trying very hard to do the right thing, but they're not enough. Mm -hmm. They're not enough. Um, and I think it's interesting, actually, um, in the U.S., for example, I think... It'll be easier for American politics to absorb this and respond uh, because there's such a clear need to break from the Trump era. Yeah. It has been so disastrous for the country that, um, you know, should Harris uh, win this fall, um, that that it'll be easier to to just make that break. Yeah. I, I've, I've said for a long time now that what... What needs to be done in America is very clear. We need to get Putin's puppet, Trump, exactly. in our rearview mirror, and exactly. then we can be a far better ally exactly. to Ukraine. Because the fear, I do honestly believe, in, in the American body politic is that should we overplay our hand here in Ukraine or make a, a misstep in Ukraine and he gets in on the back of that, that will be disastrous, not only for the American project, but obviously for Ukraine as well. Mm -hmm. What, what is it in Europe? What is the what is what what is the resistance? What is what is the block that I mean? It's Trump in America. The block in Europe. What is what is why is it so resistant to recognizing? this very real threat. From well, Moscow. firstly, I mean, we can't just say there's a block in Europe because Europe is huge. And sure. we actually, um, I mean, for example, um, in the Baltics, in Central Eastern Europe, the there is that, no block. They the, understand the very well. The have hi a history yeah. and, and, and understanding right. of the very real threat. So do you threat. mean Western? So the, Bal I, I yeah, mean, so the Balts, uh, the former Warsaw Pact nations, mm -hmm. uh, even to a certain extent, the Dutch, they have been far more proactive mm -hmm. than, say, a Germany or a France, uh, mm -hmm. and certainly like a Spain or a Portugal. Yeah. Um, we see it in Scandinavia. They've, they're kind of coming around to it because, mm -hmm. of course, they also. Yeah. But I, I guess what it does boil right down to is, is Germany. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, so when we talk about Europe, uh, we have to be careful because Euro yeah. Europe is a big family. Yeah, it is. And we don't all agree. And it's a federal. And that's a good thing. It's a federal. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's a. It's a, a, a commonwealth. It's, it's a collection of very disparate. It's not like the mm. United States. It's it's a yeah. everybody's got their own histories, and the tapestry of Europe is very different than yeah. America. Um, but that being said, um, to to talk about Germany, um, well, quite frankly, Germany walks in lockstep with the United States, mm. and. Over the past year plus, what we've seen, I think, is actually an even increased level of coordination between Washington and Berlin. Mm -hmm. They've both been kind of covering each other's backs on this escalation management appeasement policy. Mm -hmm. A lot of our allies- Which is very frustrating for the Ukrainians. I yes. can attest to that personally. So our allies in Central and Eastern and Northern Europe um, have been- pushing for more, um, our British and French allies have also uh, taken steps to show, for example, with their delivery of long-range missiles before the Americans and the Germans agreed to showing that this was possible without World War III breaking out. Mm -hmm. um, this comes back to your earlier question about the escalation fears, all right? How do we manage Russian escalation. We know that Russia wants to escalate this this war. It is their goal, number one, to destroy Ukraine, yeah. to take over the country, to occupy it, to kill as many Ukrainians as necessary, and to take any survivors and subsume them into ec effective economic slavery to fuel 
uh, the vast natural resources and industrial economy of Ukraine to support the failing Russian economy. Which, again, is something out of the 20th century. textbook imperialism. Yes. Exactly. This is Russia's goal for Ukraine. All right? And if there can be anything more escalatory than killing thousands and up to millions of people and taking over an entire country, indeed the largest country in all of Europe, I don't know what escalation is. But that fear of the hot war crossing the line into a NATO member state, um, actually Russia's already been testing that out. They've allowed uh, their missiles to fly over and even crash into Polish, Mm -hmm. Slovakian, and now even Lithuanian territory, Romania as well. That's four NATO member states where Russian missiles have breached the airspace or even impacted. Just last week, when Russian missiles targeting for Ukraine were flying over Lithuanian airspace and Romanian airspace, they got escorted Yes. By F-16s. We didn't shoot them down. We gave them a military escort. It's just insane. And and, and I'm, I'm, I'm laughing bitterly. A, it's a fear of a bully. But you know what this is? This is encouraging Russia. Yes. This is showing Russia you can get away with it. Yeah. The same message that we've been giving since 2008. Go ahead. So we're that so is the escalation. Di- we're so yeah. afraid of a direct confrontation. We are actually making it more likely By showing Russia that we're scared of them and that even when they cross a so-called red line, we're not willing to back it up. We're not even willing to shoot down a Russian missile flying over our territory. And that's nonsense. However, that being said, um, recently the Polish defense minister Sikorsky uh, came out uh, with a very strong statement basically and correctly stating that... Um, For all the concerns of NATO alliance members uh, about escalation, he and uh, the Polish government have first and foremost a duty to protect the Polish people, Mm. to protect their own national security, and that shooting down missiles, Russian missiles, um, over Ukrainian airspace that could be deemed a threat to Polish airspace um, is fully their right under international law and their indeed their responsibility um, as uh, as the Polish state. And this is absolutely right. And um, I believe if the German and American alliance of inaction, <laughs> axis of inaction, I like to call them, if they continue on this dangerous path of appeasement masked as escalation prevention, they are actually going to cause the level of escalation that they fear and force Poland, the Baltic states, Finland to perhaps act in their own national, regional interest unilaterally. Exactly. And then we're Article 5 at least. Not necessarily. Do you think Russia is going to attack Poland if Poland Ah. shoots down a missile? If Poland says, if Warsaw says to Moscow, this is a red line and we're serious about it and we will do it, that you think Moscow will back down? Is there a Russian pilot riding on the back of the missile, a Dr. Strangelove style? (laughs) Um, We're talking about shooting down hardware. Yeah. Un- unmanned uh, <laughs> missiles and drones with a warhead. In our airspace. Exactly. In yeah. our airspace. Yeah. Who the hell's going to in- invade over this? No, of course they're going to back down. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it's a, know, it's a know, ridiculous it, it thought. So and actually what we could and should be doing is to call their bluff and use it to expand a zone of air defense over Ukraine. Mm-hmm. We could say, and be completely under international law as well as the basic logic of security, be completely covered and say, all right, to avoid the risk of escalation, to avoid the risk of an, of another Russian missile striking NATO territory and accidentally uh, kicking off World War III, we're going to be very cautious and helpful, and we're going to set up an air defense buffer around the NATO, Ukrainian, NATO states uh, and Ukrainian borders. So mm. that there's no risk of escalation through a Russian missile um, striking NATO territory. And what does this do? 
Um, this gives a clear warning to the Russians that striking uh, Ukrainian territory near, near the NATO border is not a good investment. It's a waste of money. Those missiles are going to get shot out of the sky, and they're expensive. Mm -hmm. So, And it neuters them. And it neuters them, and it shows, and the most important thing, it shows that they're bluffing. And shooting yeah. down a Russian missile doesn't cause World War III. Here's it's nonsense. Here's my concern with that, though. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we're, we may differ slightly on yeah, this. Good. Which we shouldn't all good and healthy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my concern is mm -hmm. that that might... Um, that might stabilize the war in a without a conclusion to it, and we end up with a, you know, thirty eighth parallel in Korea kind of. You think setting up an air defense zone? No, no. I'm, I'm saying if you if no. you if you establish that, and then potentially like some sort of DMZ situation, Europe. I'm and talking the, about Western Ukraine. You're talking about like Lviv. What about yeah. the northern? Would, would you so include the, the Belarusian Pol border? No, no. I'm talking about the border areas to NATO member states. Okay. Yes. So right? uh, there were 100%. Yeah. yeah. This is what I'm saying. Then let me yeah. pose this yeah. other scenario, which mm -hmm. has been yeah. floated, of right. an idea of mm -hmm. a DMZ right. mm -hmm. in Donetsk. What do you think? Because to my mind, that only postpones the inevitable. I think that's a terrible idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we are look, in agreement look, there. Look at, look at uh, North and South Korea. Right. It just perpetuates this, a, a, this, this yeah. fugue state. It um, never ends. This is not a solution. No. And frankly, um, <laughs> unless the DMZ is still on Korsk territory, <laughs> I don't think the Ukrainians <laughs> will go for it. Um, no, the Ukrainians, I'm sure, won't go exactly. for it. Exactly. But, you know, um, so I know it's, been yeah, I mean, it, it is, it's been floated and it will get floated because also, uh, you know, to be, to be kind to um, the folks who, who float this, um, when people are presented with a, a complex uh, and scary situation they don't understand and don't know how to respond, they'll naturally reach for something familiar. Mm. And the North South Korean uh, DMZ is something familiar. Yeah. It's like, well, we so had one of those in World War III, didn't start, so can we just do another one? Right. Um, but it's, uh, and it's, I also it's think not a solution. There's something on the West's <laughs> yeah. perspective where it's just like, make it go away, make it go away, make exactly. it go away. But this exactly. is what Minsk one and two were yeah. all about. Exactly. It was like stick our hands and our, you know, fingers yeah. in our ears and go, no, 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 this yeah. isn't happening. Exactly. Unless this is properly resolved, yeah. it'll just, it, it'll just keep happening. Mm. So we I, need yeah. to stop pretending. Stop lying to ourselves that Russia is somehow a normal country that we can negotiate with. No. We have tried that mm. for 10 years. Yeah. Every agreement was broken. They're not acting in good faith. Uh, they didn't, up until the bombs were falling on this city where we sit right now in the morning of February 24th, 2022, the German government was blithely saying, oh, no, it's not going to happen. We spoke with the Russians and they told us they weren't going to do it. So I know, it, it, anyone's it my mind. still trying to push the notion that we can talk sense into the Russians or with them, they have misunderstood the nature of this conflict and the nature of our adversary. And so in a, in a way, those folks in our governments and media are at this point arguably the biggest threat in turning this into a forever war. If we had taken decisive action when the taking was hot yeah. in 2022, we could have ended this. And instead, people put on the brakes and gave the Russians the entire winter to regroup, reassess, enforce their front lines, and, and wage a new war. So... It's it's uh, like so many things. It's it's our own fault um, for letting it get this far. Um, but that being said, democracies they're they're messy, and we can't just take overnight decisions because we need to debate. We need we need to agree. But once we get on the right path, once we understand the nature of the threat, once we understand the nature of our adversary, and understand what's at stake then we would and we would be capable of decisive action. And I think, for example, uh, implementing a no-fly zone um, around the border regions to NATO states 
It's a perfectly viable way to show once again, the dictator has no clothes. Mm -hmm. The Russians are bluffing. Mm -hmm. Us and shooting we're down- Ultimately, we're stronger than us they Us shooting are. down missiles over Lviv is not going to cause the Russians to, you know, bomb Berlin. It's nonsense. <laughs> They're scared of us. They're more scared of us than we should be scared of them. Here, here. Um, and now, you know, thanks to our power problems, I'm going to kind of- uh, <laughs> Also brought to you by Russia. <laughs> also brought to you by Russia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is just how mm. we live. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to, I'm going to try and circle around to an end here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there, I have also heard floated from certain areas and particularly here in Ukraine, uh, but not only in Ukraine, that there is some concern in Germany in particular of a power balance shift should Ukraine be brought on board into the brotherhood of European mm. nations. Mm. This is an enormous country yeah. with potentially an enormous GDP. There's talk of a resumption of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So it's so kind of a, a partnership, uh, whether just solely economic or mm -hmm. otherwise, diplomatic, military. Yeah on that stretch from the Baltic down to the Black Sea. Right. Do you think there's any fear in Germany of a, a, a power balance shift when it comes to your Ukraine coming on board? Or online, I'll, I'll answer that with, with a really great German word, jein. Means yes and no, ja and nein, put together is jein. So jein. Um, uh, We're Americans. We, we don't hold two yeah, ideas at the know, same time I'm, very I'm well. Totally, I'm, I'm totally trying to get jein to catch on because if you guys have picked up Schadenfreude and like Fahrvergnügen, jein is easy That's a and, good one. and much and, better and, to use. And to try yeah. and get that concept yeah. into the American yeah. uh, mentality, being able yeah, to hold exactly. two if ideas you can at the say same Schadenfreude, time. you can say jein. <laughs> <laughs> right? But anyway, um, Jan, because, um, so spare you all the wonky details, yes, bringing Ukraine into the EU mm -hmm. would be a huge undertaking. Yes. Um, and just to name the one like biggest issue, it would be the European agricultural subsidies. All right. How we subsidize farmers, it's, it's based on like quota. Mm -hmm. And basically Ukraine has such a huge agricultural sector. Um, sector that it would vastly reduce uh, the subsidies going to the existing pool of European farmers because all of a sudden you'd have this huge pool of new ones coming from a country that is not paying in as much as, say, a Germany or a France. Mm -hmm. So this, the whole agricultural subsidy uh, policy and budget, which is a huge cornerstone of the EU budget, <laughs> Um, would have to be redesigned and rethought. And I'm not an expert on agricultural <laughs> policy here, so save that for another episode. Fair enough. Um, but, but that's a major issue that would have far-reaching implications um, for all uh, of, of EU farming, right? So, so this is an issue that I'm, I'm not going to speak much more on because, because it's not my specialty. But it's a legitimate issue where people are rightly concerned, how are we going to do that? That being said, all right, then take the time and figure it out and reform the system because Europe, like the United States, it's a work in progress and this is normal. We've expanded so many times, we've brought in so many members with different strengths and weaknesses and on the whole, um, yes, Ukraine is huge um, and and any country of such a size uh, joining the union would, would create um, challenges, but above all of these challenges, we would be gaining so much. Yeah. Um, the human capital here the incredible, uh, incredible reinvigoration um, of commitment to democracy um, that this would bring, um, and on a sort of uh, you know cold benefit level, <laughs> the best defense uh, industry um, on tried the continent. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, the tried and tested um, defense industry and fighting force. Um, we would we would gain so much knowledge um, and industry insight. Um, you know, as well as all these ports and all this incredible farmland joining the union, you, you know, so for all the fears of what would happen on a domestic level um, and what kinds of investments uh, would, would Ukraine need uh, to, to join, um, I think this is wrong and small thinking. Um, what is Europe for? What do we exist for? Mm -hmm. um, a Ukraine without Europe is not safe and a Europe without Ukraine is not complete. 
So uh, as, as Ursula von der Leyen and many EU officials have already said, you know, the future of Ukraine is in Europe. And that's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, and any fears... And it, resolve, it resolves a yeah. centuries old um, issue when it comes yeah. to European security yeah. is, is who controls that triangle between the Baltic the Adriatic and the Black Sea. And that's what two world wars were fought well, over I think last the, century. I think the people living there would say, fuck off, we live here and we decide how and where uh, we want to live. Yeah, and they would be saying that and most likely to And we want to be to most, in, in the Moscow. EU, yeah. exactly. And as far as Ukrainians <laughs> are concerned, they're done being a colony. They, they're not gonna answer, mm -hmm. they're not going to be a colony of Brussels or DC. They're not just gonna mm -hmm. swap Moscow. And the sooner I think we get that into our mentality in the West, the better. Um, what do you think about where Russia is at the end of all this? Putin is on a, there is a clock ticking mm -hmm. somewhere for oh, yes. Vladimir Putin. Nobody survives a disastrous war like no. this. If you're the Russian leader, if you're the guy in the Kremlin, when you lose dominion over the Black Sea, mm -hmm. when you not only turn your former, albeit, you know, pretty unpleasant relationship with your neighbor mm. into an adversarial one. You've mm. lost Kiev forever. You've lost Odessa forever. Mm. And you've lost dominion of the Black Sea. No Russian leader. I don't care if you're a czar or a head of the Politburo. Mm. You're screwed. Yeah. His, his fall out going? of the top floor of his underground bunker is predetermined. <laughs> 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 yeah, I like that. His fall from his underground bunker. Well, it is coming, but what do you think that means for Russia? And for Russia's, Russia's oh, Europe is always going to have a relationship with Russia. And unless sure. Russia makes some real significant difference, uh, you know, changes and, yeah. and modernization, they're not going to be brought into the European family. So what do you think that looks like after this, after this war? Number one, let the future of Russia be Russia's problem, all right? The Russian people need to decide what kind of country they want to be. And if they're willing to get out on the streets and praise Prigozhin in his march on Moscow, um, let's see if they're willing to hitch their wagons to someone else post-Putin. Mm -hmm. And who that someone else is and how batshit crazy they are or not, well, that's their choice. You know, people act like the Russians have no agency. Well, they do. They do. Um, so own that. I mean, what what kind of a Germany was was the world was the rest of Europe willing to accept after World War II? Uh, a defeated country um, full of the ones who went along with it. Um, because most of the people who stood up against the Nazis were killed. Right. We found a way to rejoin the community of nations because we were under occupation. And we were basically forced into a democracy, mm -hmm. right? That's not gonna happen in Russia, okay? Russia's not gonna turn into Sweden after this war. Um, but what can we do? Um, we can and should already be increasing our knowledge of and our ties with the Central Asian republics that are part of the Russian Federation. Um, there is a huge amount of ignorance about any sort of political, cultural, um, historical, uh, and security context in Central Asia. People people just have this, in, in the US in particular, and also in Western Europe, this is a vague sense of everything from Poland to Vladivostok is somehow kind of Russia, question mark, which of course we now know is, is nonsense. Um, we, we didn't get enough of this in history class. Well, guess what, it's time to, Time to do some after-school studies, catch up, get oriented, talk to the people who do know, and start getting to know the players. Because I think what we need to see um, is containment of the threats that would come from a destabilized Russia, um, but certainly no attempt to maintain the Russia as we know it. Okay, the Russia as we know it has been a source of wars and international terrorism uh, and hybrid warfare for 30 years. Enough's enough, guys. We, we, we don't need this Russia anymore. Mm -hmm. And so anyone um, from our side who's, who's somehow trying to maintain it, um, I think it's more out of fear of the unknown of what would come after. And, um, and that's just a bad understanding of history. 
borders change, imperial borders in particular. Mm -hmm. um, the British Empire fell apart. That was a decades-long bloody process. People like to, to somehow think, oh, yeah, World War II ended, and then all of a sudden we overnight became happy, friendly Democrats. No. <laughs> the Allied powers were imperial powers, um, <laughs> even when uh, the war ended. So the de-imperialization of Russia will take a long time, uh, is currently at this time even very bloody. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to look at the threat of nuclear proliferation, who has access to which weapons facilities, uh, what players need to, where do we need to keep the channels open and the lines of influence, whatever that needs to mean, open, so that in a case, should the current Kremlin administration be decapitated, literally and figuratively, that we don't have a situation where um, nuclear infrastructure and materials Loose are nukes. being exactly yeah. are being um, sold. That's that's a serious threat. But the good news is, guess what? People are already on this. People are already looking at this. I should hope so. Yes, you know this is not um, this is something we can and should be preparing for. Um, and also, above all, looking at the power players in the region, some territories, some of the republics may seek independence mm -hmm. at some point in the coming decades. And my impression from discussions with folks, policymakers in Western Europe and in the United States is we can't even find most of these places on the map. Yeah. So this is why I'm emphasizing before even making any predictions uh, and trying to give any advice as to what to do, the first and foremost, start talking to experts from those regions. They are living and working throughout the Western world. They're ready and able to talk to us, to introduce us to their contacts, to parties and politicians and civic organizations and journalists and industry leaders in those republics. We need to start making new friends and just even getting oriented and understanding who we're dealing with and building those relationships, setting the groundwork for what could possibly come next. And not just next. talk to Moscow, but rather exactly. talk to- Exactly, talk to the regions. Talk to the regions. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the neighboring countries as well. I yeah. mean, I'm, I'm not a Central Asia expert by any means, but the more I read, the more and the more I talk to folks from Central Asia, the more I learn how little I know. Yeah. And that's exactly what our policymakers need to start doing in our intelligence agencies. We need to start talking to more folks, getting a better uh, mental map of the situation, the pros, the cons, the risks, and the possible benefits, um, so that when the time comes, we're not just caught flat on our asses. And if it isn't a a, a collapse of the federation. You know, if if it is more stable than our worst fears, then mm. what have we lost? Is that even a fear? I'm not even saying it's a fear. I'm just saying it's a possibility. Right. Um, but also, if if the, if the Federation stays together with its current borders, um, that's also not a fear. You know, it's again, we just need to prepare. What would be the ideal outcome? What are the players in the Kremlin who who would not be uh, so that shit crazy, and I use that as a technical term. Um, uh, you know, your Medvedevs and, uh, and such. Um, <laughs> you know, there are the opportunists above and all who simply want to get out of this alive and still have their villa to go back to on the, yeah. on the French Riviera when, when it's over. Um, and it sounds uh, crass, but, I mean, this is politics. We cannot continue to appease and enable Putin uh, at the expense of our own security and the survival of Ukraine, full stop. And beyond that, um, we should look at the mid to long term uh, collapse of Putin's government as a good thing. Mm. Um, and instead of fearing it, we just need to prepare for it. That's normal. Yeah. I mean, let's. Because it is going to happen. It's going to happen. And I mean, remember in the, in the 90s, uh, the Americans were scared of the thought of uh, the Warsaw Pact nations uh, breaking ties with Moscow, and you know, they didn't want Ukraine yeah. uh, to to become independent because they were afraid of what Moscow would think. 
How did that work out? So we need to read up on our history. Don't fear the inevitable. Prepare for it. Because only if we start preparing for it now and informing ourselves better and expanding our networks um, on an overt diplomatic as well as a covert intelligence level, only then will we be able to potentially influence events. Let Europe be Europe with an Ukraine in it. Let Russia be Russia, whatever it's going to with be. With China sitting on it. <laughs> <laughs> but certainly a demise of the concept of Russian empire. Um, I am deathly afraid we're going to... Of course, another instance why living in Ukraine makes producing... Uh, yes, Mark mm -hmm. Hamill. Thank you, Luke Skywalker. Okay. Well, this, this is this good is for your clearly, readers or for clearly, your your, yeah, your viewers to is, see. This is the gods telling us we got to wrap yeah, it up. And this here. is daily life and under this Russian is terror. Daily life in in Moscow or in uh, in Kiev under in, and throughout Russian terror and throughout um, yeah uh, Ukraine. So, but it's also a message for me to wrap this up. Um, I do want to quickly ask you, in considering all of this, where do you see this country, Ukraine? Uh, you know, as all wars do eventually come to an mm. end, what are your aspirations? What are your hopes? Uh, and what is your, maybe even your prognosis for Ukraine? For when the war ends, you yes, mean? Yes, a conclusion. Above all, and I know we wouldn't be able to give this to them, but I wish every Ukrainian two months of paid holiday. <laughs> um. I say that lightly, but um, in all truth, this is, um, it's exhausting. This country, these people are traumatized. Um, they're beyond burnout. And my, my fervent wish is for us, Ukraine's allies, to end this war as quickly as possible because only we have the power to do that by increasing our aid and our speed. We could end this war in the next year if we would do what it takes to stop Russian missiles, to give Ukraine the air defense they need, to support them even with our air defenses from the bordering NATO states. We could establish a no-fly zone and a no-bomb zone over Ukraine, and we could help them win this war within a year if we were willing to do that. But however long it takes, Ukraine will be free. But so many families have lost loved ones, and so many more will continue to. Yeah. Um, and I've I've lived and worked in in countries at war and and in post war environments, so I know, I know what years of prolonged conflict do to people and to a country. Um, on the one hand, um, Ukrainians, as you very well know, are are brilliant. Um, are hardworking, are creative, are resourceful. resilient, resilient, resourceful, exactly. So they will get through this um, and they will build this country. But also we need to be here for them in the post-war era for reconstruction, rebuilding the destroyed cities and towns into the most green and sustainable cities and towns on the planet. Uh, we need to turn this destruction into an opportunity for renewal uh, and investment in new technologies, sustainable urban planning uh, and construction. Um, there, there are so many economic uh, opportunities and sustainability opportunities that could grow out of out of this this horrible fight. Um, so many job opportunities that that would carry with it for Ukrainians. Um, and for others across the EU. But first and foremost, we need to end the killing. Mm -hmm. We need peace. We need to give people um, the space to, to heal and come to terms with the horrible losses um, that they've suffered. Um, and we need to recommit to European defense and security and the ideals on which we were founded. No war in Europe, peace and freedom in Europe. That's what this was supposed to be for. Mm -hmm. And we need to assess where we went wrong and root out the corruption within all of Europe, within Ukraine and without. Yeah. All of the corruption and the appeasement and the self-delusion that enabled this war um, to reach the point it did. 
uh, to ensure that nothing like this can ever happen again. Yeah, and it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a lot of hard work, hopefully uh, aided by a lot of seized Russian assets, but uh, we shall see how that goes. Um, Mm -hmm. But I agree with you 100%. I think there's a bright future for Ukraine, and because of a bright future for Ukraine, a bright future for Europe. Mm -hmm. And maybe it took something like this for us to remember how important it is of our ideals of Mm -hmm. Europe. And, you know, the age of enlightenment and all the rest of it. Uh, Freedom and democracy are like a foreign language. Use it or lose it. And right now we're in the phase where we're at risk of losing it and we better relearn how to use it (laughs) and appreciate what we have. It's a great way of putting it. Jessica, (laughs) thank you so much for coming, sitting down and talking with us, even with all the distractions that just come part and parcel yeah. of being in Ukraine. No worries. Uh, the, the, the fact that I can't effectively uh, make a podcast is probably pretty low on the totem pole of priorities. We're doing all right Ukraine. here. But, <laughs> but nevertheless, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your input and your, uh, your insight. And um, it's been a wonderful discussion. Thanks ever so much. Thanks, Phil.